I'm sure we're all passingly familiar with this story. Let's sum it up real quick. A great king goes, hey guys, let's build a tower to heaven, and starts building. God goes, oh no 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 man, and explodes the tower. The people find that they don't speak the same language and just scatter to the winds. Basically, it's one of those God is a dick stories. Or is it? Let's find out. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinhar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them all over the face of the whole earth. Wow! God is a dick! At least until you peel back the symbolism and add context. First off, there's no mention of the king. We must go back to Genesis 10, verse 8 to 10. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, and Kale in Shinhar. Oh look, the whole plain of Shinhar was his kingdom. It's safe to say that he had a role in decision making. Anyways, Nimrod. The biblical name is also important. And no, it doesn't mean dim-witted. Nimrod is derived from the Hebrew word Nimrod, or let us revolt. Names are significant. So what is he rebelling against? A tyrant? His parents? Meatloaf Monday? Well, here's another question. Why was Nimrod mentioned as a hunter? Everyone in those days hunted. That's how you got food. So why mention his hunting specifically right after saying he's a great warrior? Because he wasn't a hunter in the traditional sense, a hunter of animals. He was a hunter of people. He tracked and trapped people. As the Bible says, he was a great warrior. He was a conqueror, an enslaver, a tyrant. He was a hunter of man who put himself before the Lord. He was rebelling against the Lord. In simple terms, Nimrod's a bad dude. Now what does Nimrod the tyrant do? The first thing that happens is that he has the people make bricks. Bricks are being made before the city and tower are even conceived. And you don't make bricks unless you plan to build something. But here, he's building the bricks before he's even planned to build something. There's something else going on here. I mean, just think about this for a minute. What are bricks? They're stones shaped by human hands, made to be the same, identical, interchangeable, replaceable. Conversely, what are stones? Solid rock, molded by nature to be unique, different. Get it? Bricks are a metaphor for people. It's no coincidence that the story points out the use of bricks instead of stone. Nimrod is taking these people, unique individuals, and forcing them and conforming them into his desires. Shaping the stones that people are and sculpting them into bricks, replaceable, interchangeable bricks. And the bricks are held together with mortar instead of tar. Now what's the significance of that? Well, we have another man-made material, mortar. You know how it goes. Bricks lay down, splash mortar so that they stay together. The people are being forced to stay together by something that's entirely man-made. How is this not a metaphor for materialism? So let's break it down. What's going on here? Nimrod isn't simply building a shiny tower. He's building a city with a shiny tower. A society. The people were sculpted to be uniform and conforming all held together by mortar and materialism, made to sacrifice their agency and their individuality for the tower, for the greater good, you see. It is how we will make a name for ourselves so that God himself can look at what we've done. We'll reach heaven itself. It's how we'll avoid being scattered to the winds. How fragile is your society if it depends on a giant-ass tower? Then God comes along and is just like, whoa. If they put their minds to it, there's nothing that they can't do as long as they have a common language. The problem is, they don't have a common language. Without materialism binding them together, what commonality do they have? Heritage? Values? Belief? Nothing. They were already speaking a different language. They just didn't realize it until God ripped the veil from their eyes. 
One could say God turned them all back into stone, but I think it's more accurate to say that he took away their materialism. Now what does all this mean? The Tower of Babel is very much a cautionary tale. There is always a greater good out there, a great and lofty cause, a promise of a brighter but impossible future. Maybe if you give one more loan of $200 to your drug-addicted cousin, he could get clean. Maybe if you watched Harvey Weinstein shower, you could get that lucrative acting gig. Maybe if you went along with the idol worshippers in Brussels with their plans for a European superstate, all the problems in Europe would be solved forever. There are causes worth fighting for and a future worth pursuing, but be certain you are doing it for the right reasons, for the glory of God, not the glory of man, and never, ever allow yourself to be molded to conform to someone else's ambition. You are a stone, not a brick. But this isn't the only lesson in this cautionary tale. All God needed to do to scatter Babel to the winds was remove the mortar, the materialism. Tell me, what happens to our society when our iPhones and our internet stop working? Say a terrorist attack or a solar flare knocks out the power grid. We'll scatter to the winds. Liberals and conservatives, socialists and anarcho-capitalists. We're already speaking different languages. What unites us is our stuff. Now, I love video games and talking about Star Wars as much as the next talking cartoon lizard, so I'm hardly the one to be criticizing materialism. But we should still find things that unite us. The Tower of Babel is calling for us to unite as Americans, as Brits, as French, as Germans, as people. Individual, unique stones held together by the tar, not the mortar, of our values, our common culture, our traditions, and our mutual desire for a better world. As the Lord said, when we are united, there is nothing we cannot do. Link down below is a discussion between Glenn Beck and Rabbi Daniel Lappin that I took a lot of inspiration from. I recommend you go watch it as it goes into a lot of the ideas I covered in better detail.